Uh, hi everybody. Uh, I guess I have the privilege to be the last speaker today, so I prepared uh, this short presentation uh, about something that isn't done very frequently in the kernel, uh, which is porting it to a new processor architecture. Uh, so two years ago I was hired by a French uh, computer lab uh, called uh, Leap6 to port Linux to a new processor architecture that they were developing uh, called SAR. So SAR was a European project. I say was because the project is over now. Uh, aiming to define a massively uh, parallel architecture, uh, meaning uh, up to thousands uh, of cores, like small and energy efficient processor cores, around a network on chip. Uh, with a shared and hardware maintained coherent memory. That's the nice feature of this uh, architecture. Uh, so the first question that came to mind was, uh, is a new port necessary? So as uh, um, LWN uh, rep rightly reported last year in an article, uh, there are like three meanings to the word porting. And for me, it was kind of a dilemma because the, the TSAR architecture uh, was based on a MIPS32 uh, compatible course. And so my pod could potentially fall into the second category. Uh, but the thing is, the memory model of TSAR was radically different from those of the MIPS family. And it would have forced me to change a lot of things in the MIPS branch to make that happen. And actually, someone before me had tried this option and had failed. So I went with the most sort of logical and interesting option, which was starting a new port from scratch. So how to start a new port? So a new port is a two-step process. Uh, first, there must exist a minimal set of files that define a minimal uh, set of symbols so functions, variables, macros, and so on, uh, for the kernel to even compile. And once the kernel compiles, uh, and we can sort of start running it on the targeted hardware, then actually we can notice that the boot sequence is, is very sequential, which means that we can leave uh, many functions empty at first and implement them gradually until we reach the uh, init process and we know that it's good. So down there you can see uh, a part of this uh, minimal set of files. Uh, so we have a typical um, uh, directory layout uh, of an arch port. So in configs we have uh, the different configurations uh, for the, uh, the default configurations for the supported uh, system, hardware systems. Uh, then we have the include directories, a uh, directory with two subdirectories, uh, ASM for internal uh, headers, so the headers that are used uh, by the Linux source code only, and then the UAPI, which forms the, the, the user interface, so those are the headers that are meant to be exported to the user space. Uh, so I'll, I'll come back to that later. Uh, then in kernel, it's, it's, kernel is this directory where, where everything that doesn't belong to other directories goes into. Uh, then in lib, we have the uh, optimized uh, um, utility routines such as memcopy, memset, and so on, mostly written in assembly language. Uh, and finally, in mm, we have the memory management uh, file. Uh, so basically, we we see that with by by filling uh, the configs the configs uh, directory with a default configuration uh, by adding a k, k config file and a make file, only that can uh, enable us to um, generate an initial configuration of Linux, customize it. Uh, I'm speaking about the dot config that we have at the top of the of the Linux source when we start compiling, and actually we can start compiling. Obviously, it's going to I mean the compilation is going to stop right away because we don't have any code. But 
but getting like the build system up and running is, is really easy. Uh, then back to the headers a bit. Uh, I won't go into details about that, but it's actually a very big part of the porting. I just checked yesterday on my porting and some other portings in Linux, and the headers, they account for like 30% of my port, and I checked the um, newly reintroduced uh, Reza, uh, Renesas uh, pro processor. So it's a big, big piece of code. Uh, it could be bigger, actually, but Fortunately, thanks to the uh, ASM generic layer, the generic header layer, uh, it's kept to a minimum, but still, so for everything that touches uh, the uniqueness of a processor, so I'm talking about uh, TLBs, page tables, uh, uh, cache management, everything has to be customized. We can't use the generic versions for that. Uh, Okay, and so then once we have this uh, Linux that compiles, um, we can start implementing the different functions. Uh, so here we have like uh, an excerpt of the, of the boot sequence, starting with kernel entry, which is the first, very first function, uh, usually written in assembly language, that the bootloader jumps to uh, once it's uh, done loading the kernel image in, mem image in memory. Uh, kernel entry calls uh, start kernel, which is the first C function that's completely arch independent. Uh, then this function start initi initializing a, a bunch of stuff and calls uh, many uh, arch specific functions, which are the functions that have this little star. And finally, uh, it creates two kernel threads <laughs> Uh, kernel init, uh, which is the thread that will finish the initialization and then launch the init process. So this one is created first because it needs to have the PID number one. Uh, and right after that, we have the creation of kthread add uh, D, which is the key thread uh, daemon. Uh, that's the thread that is supposed to create other threads. Uh, and finally, this execution flow ends uh, by becoming the boot idle thread. So let's like uh, enumerate all of those functions, uh, starting with the very first one. Uh, so the early assembly boot code. Uh, so this function is very scary at first because it's a lot of assembly language and well. But in the end, if we uh, analyze that a bit, it actually just performs a few tasks which, is, which are not very complicated. Uh, basically, as soon as it takes over from the bootloader, it puts the, the processor in a known state because we have no idea what's happened before. We don't know if the, like, the system just rebooted. We don't know which bootloader like, just loaded us. So basically, just by, we're being cautious and we just like, put, reset the processor to a default state. Uh, we clear the uh, uninitialized data section. Uh, so we're sure that all of those variables will have the uh, value zero. Uh, then we save the bootloader arguments. So for example, the device tree that the bootloader uh, might have given us. Uh, then we can initialize the first page table. And in this page table, we want to map the kernel image. Uh, then we can enable the virtual memory and jump into the virtual space because before that the processor was running in the physical address space. Uh, and finally we can set up the stack register and optionally the current thread info register and we can now call the first C function. Uh, not a long time after this first C function start kernel uh, calls setup arch. The idea of setup arch, so at this point, at this very first moment, only the kernel image is mapped in the virtual memory. So basically, it's almost impossible to allocate any memory, which is a big problem. So the job of this setup arch function is to map as much memory as possible so, so that then we can allocate some memory. So basically, we're going to scan the device tree 
discover the memory banks uh, and register them into the main block layer. Uh, by scanning the device tree, we're also going to figure out the address of the terminal, uh, like the console of the serial console or whatever. And so then we can have the early print K uh, infrastructure up and running, which is extremely useful for debugging. Uh, and finally, we can finish configuring memblock, which is which means uh, defining which portion of the physical memory we can map directly, which is what's called the low memory, uh, and um, put all of the, those uh, memory pages into the different memory zones. Uh, then we have trap init. So trap init is part of, of the uh, trap infrastructure, which is how to receive uh, interrupts and exceptions and treat them. Uh, trap init in itself is very small, but there is, a, there is a big piece of code sort of hidden behind that. And part of this piece of code is the exception vector. So uh, it's those four lines in, in my case uh, to which the processor jump jumps uh, whenever an exception or an interrupt uh, arises. Uh, here we see that actually the exception vector is a very small <coughs> piece of code that acts as a dispatcher, so we get the cause of why we're here, and we can uh, get a function, uh, function pointer from a table and jump to this function, so this function can, can take, off, take care of uh, why we're here. Uh, so in the end, trapping it is just a matter of configuring the processor so that it jumps to this piece of code whenever something happens. And then initialize this uh, exception handler's uh, table uh, with the addresses of all the sub-handlers. Sub uh, so just a tiny bit of code here. So on the left, you can see examples of those sub-handlers, which, which are also written in SMB language. Uh, so save all, for example, is a macro uh, that saves the context of, of whatever thread was interrupted. So we can uh, come back to it later by, by restoring this context. Uh, and then actually, pretty quickly, we see that uh, we jump to a higher level uh, C function that can make sort of better uh, decisions. Um, then we have meminit, which is very small. The only uh, point in meminit is to release all of the free memory, so the memory that has not been allocated or reserved by the mem block uh, layer into the body allocator, which is also known as the page allocator. And actually, right after that, the kernel is able to uh, start uh, the slab allocator and the vmalloc infrastructure because both of them are based on the body allocator. Uh, then we have init IRQ. Uh, this one also is actually quite simple. It only scans the device tree, uh, find all the, the nodes that are identified as interrupt controllers uh, and sort of launch the driver that is associated with what's, what's been found. So basically it means that in a new system, if your interrupt controller already has a driver, you don't have anything to do. If it doesn't, then it's time to implement your first uh, device driver, which is fun. Uh, and finally, to like finish this uh, early boot, uh, phase. We have the time in it, which is part of uh, um, initializing the time peak keeping uh, infrastructure. Uh, so kind of same as um, in it IRQ, we pass the device tree and look for clock provider nodes, uh, which can be as simple as just defining a fixed frequency. Uh, and then we pass uh, the device to again, uh, and we're, we're looking for clock source nodes. So here, like uh, Linux, actually needs two kinds of abstractions, time keeping abstractions. Uh, first, it needs what is called a clock source device, 
uh, which basically will define the basic timeline uh, using a monotonic counter, like for example, it's going to count system cycles. Uh, and then it needs a clock event device, so which on this monotony, uh, this basic timeline can uh, set up sort of dates and raise interrupts. And actually it's on the clock event device that the scheduler is plugged uh, onto, so it can basically share the, the CPU resource between many threads. Uh, and usually, uh, unless it already exists, uh, it's, uh, you have to write uh, your second device driver for the, for the clock source uh, uh, devices. And uh, finally, well, then as I was saying earlier, uh, once this sort of early boot phase is, is done, you have to create uh, new threads uh, which are in turn going to uh, launch the init process, so the first user space pr uh, process. So to get to that, the long is kind of uh, the road is kind of long and uh, and complex. So I, I'm just giving you this this overview. What we need to be able to create kernel threads and like threads in general, applications or whatever. Uh, so in terms of process management. A lot of the process management is totally uh, Arch independent, but there are a few things that, that the Arch specific code has to provide, which is uh, which deals a lot with uh, setting up the stack for new threads. Because what happens is that uh, Linux is very lazy and it doesn't really know how to start a new thread from scratch. So what's going to happen is that we're going to, when we create a new thread, we're going to uh, pretend that this thread uh, had a past. So instead of launching this thread, we're going to resume it. Even if it never was never executed before, we're going to pretend it was. And so it's just a matter of like restoring it on the CPU. And for that, we have to sort of fake a, 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 an old context of this thread on the stack so it can be resumed properly. Uh, we also need to be able to switch between threads, which involves very Arch specific code. Uh, then like uh, what's gonna happen, once again, Linux is very lazy. Whenever it wants to run a user application, Linux is not gonna load any user pages in advance. So basically uh, it's gonna like give the processor resource to the user application and the application first line is gonna like pr cause the memory fault because no one is nothing is loaded, no pages is loaded in memory. So for that we need a page fault handler which is able to catch those memory faults and then like do the appropriate uh, things to do, which mostly is like okay, the page is missing in memory, we have to like take it from the disk or whatever and bring it back to memory and we can start the application again. Uh, then if we want uh, user applications to be able to request services uh, to the kernel, uh, so by system calls, uh, we have to first define the list of system calls that the kernel can <coughs> offer to the to user applications. Uh, and we also need to be able to uh, receive those system calls and process them. And so that means like we need to improve uh, the trap handler to be able to like process system calls properly. Uh, then if we, if we want the init process to be able to um, launch new uh, user applications by forking, for example, uh, we need the system management to be uh, up and running. Uh, and that means that, so basically what happens is that when a process receives a signal uh, that is not uh, masked, in which case the signal is just ignored and nothing happens. But so the process has defined a uh, handler, a uh, signal handler. Then it's up to Linux to sort of alter the execution flow of this process uh, to execute this handler whenever necessary. And that requires some uh, bit of magic as well. 
to like set up a, a, a temporary context for just executing this handler and then coming back to the original process. Uh, and finally, uh, we have this uh, U access uh, infrastructure, which is uh, useful for exchanging data from uh, the kernel to uh, user applications. So basically what's going on is that whenever the kernel wants to access user pages, uh, it cannot crash. Otherwise, it's like the system completely crashes. So what's, what happened is that we have to uh, uh, program special uh, assembly uh, routines where all of the, the writes and the loads uh, are protected whenever we try to uh, access user pages. So whenever we have a memory fault, we're able to identify that we are trying to access user pages and we can fail uh, sort of gracefully instead of of crashing the system. Uh, and so finally, uh, after all of that, it means that we were able to have a full featured uh, init process, uh, which is able to like start a lot of user applications and etc. cetera. Uh, it doesn't mean that the port is completely over, the initial uh, port is, but there are still a lot of things to do uh, possibly pushing the port upstream, which is, I guess, a big uh, piece of work. Uh, also, like keeping up, keeping it up to date, uh, because the API in the kernel change, uh, different APIs change uh, uh, very very quickly. And finally, uh, we can endlessly uh, improve this this port by adding more features such as. Uh, SMP or NUMA supports, uh, more driver and so on. The list is pretty endless. Um, and well, I will conclude by saying that um, I, I just wrote a series of articles on LWN that were published the, the, first, the past few weeks. So if you are interested in that talk and want to have like more details, uh, you can, you can, you're very welcome to uh, check them out. And that's it, if you have any question. What's going, I mean, what's usually what's going on is that the early boot phase is only taken care of by the master processor or the memory processor. Uh, and the other ones are like sleeping. So the decoder mm -hmm. put them to sleep and they wait for the interrupt to like um, uh, interrupt processor interrupt to wake up and do something and actually boot. So that happens later in the and um, so it is boot them very in this very sequential way. Uh, and uh, when they boot, they have this very short like bits of stuff to boot, which they do, and then they sort of go back to sleep uh, until every, everybody is like, awake, and then you can start distributing like. Uh, is this just I mean, everything is shared memory, so it's the same link that runs on <coughs> all of them. Well, I mean, from what I know about the cell is that you have this one sort of application processor that, that distributes stuff to the other ones, but they're not even the same architecture, so it's difficult to run the same kernel on all of them. So there you, you necessarily have this master versus slave architecture. <coughs> 
they are all of the processor cores are the same, so they can all work together on the same things. Well, thank you.